All right, so everyone, thank you for coming. Um, tell you a little bit about myself. If you want to follow me on Twitter, uh, simply Senna. My name is Kelly Senna. Um, all I pretty much talk about is sports. So if you want to know more about Valentino Rossi or Green Bay Packers, feel free to check out my Twitter feed. A um, little bit about me. This is pretty much my life. Uh, some sort of dirt bike or motorcycles, gardening, and computers. And I work at Big Nerd Ranch. Um, so my talk is called Little Test That Could. It's kind of after you know, the little engine that could. You know, if you heard the talk before, testing is hard. Um, and it's kind of getting up a hill just to get started. So you came here to hear about testing Ember, but first I would just kind of want to share a few life experiences with you. Um, so I, the things I want to talk to you, I've been through, but I'm going to change them a little bit just for like client confidentiality, and uh, they're going to be train related. So this one instance, a client calls up and says there's a bug in the application. There's supposed to be departure and arrival times displayed on the web page, but the arrival times are incorrect. So you stop what you're doing, you go to the website, you take a look, and the arrival times are indeed incorrect. Um, so what do you do? You go back and you look through the code, try to figure out what could have possibly gone wrong. You start digging through GitHub, looking through commits, trying to figure out like how is this code committed, like how was it first deployed. If you didn't write the code, maybe you go try to find a developer that did and like, ask them about it, try to get some background. So you probably write a test at this point to make sure that from now on, like the, de the arrival and departure times are always going to be correct. So that's great, but you spent half your morning retracing your steps, trying to figure out what the requirements are for departure and arrival times in the first place. And you were working on a feature, but between the panic of trying to get this bug fix out immediately and uh, trying to calm down the client, you forgot exactly what you were working on. So now you have to go back to Pivotal, remind yourself of exactly what you were working on, and maybe you're just frustrated and you're going to take your lunch break early. So this other thing that we experience is manually testing code. So Let's say you have a client that has very specific requirements for things like fuel requirements. Um, so the fuel requirements are based on things like weight of a freight train or um, the distance that it needs to travel. And the client provides these calculations. And you implement them into your application. Um, but somebody has to make sure that those calculations are correct. So there's a couple ways that you can do this. You can manually test this code yourself. So you're going to sit down, spin up the app, check the required fields, against the output, against the calculator. And you're going to do that over and over. You're going to double check and triple check it. And you might do all of that again, just to be sure. Or you could ask the client to do it. And they might do it once or twice, but they're not going to want to sit down and just really QA this application, because that's your job. So you do the manual testing. You deploy the code. But in the back of your mind, you're probably always going to wonder, like, what if a new feature was introduced later on that somehow changes the behavior of this code. You have no way of knowing until the client calls, says there's a bug, because there's a train stuck halfway through its route. So let's talk about another experience that we've probably all been through, and that's testing legacy code. So this one project I was rolled on to had been around for probably, I think, three or four years. And it's a whole new industry. I didn't know any of the terminology. I wasn't quite sure how the code worked or what did what. So usually my go-to is looking at documentation. But this project didn't really have much documentation. So my backup plan is usually to check out a test suite. This legacy code didn't have much test. So my backup to my backup plan is to try to write a test. So I picked something simple, or what I thought was something simple. I picked uh, guaranteed delivery. It seems an idea that we're all familiar with. You, want, you have an item, you want it to go to a certain destination by a certain time. It seemed simple enough. But in this industry, it wasn't quite so simple. So after spending more time than I like to admit, I finally got a passing test for guaranteed deliveries. But it took more than 28 lines of setup code. So how could I have ever known that testing 
Guaranteed deliveries would take so much setup. Yeah, so all of these experiences just kind of left me wondering, what if? Like, what if there was a way that we could get that notification faster if something wasn't working? Or what if we could get that feedback that that code you're about to deploy doesn't do what you think it does before the client calls? So I decided to change my approach to development. Instead of writing my test after the fact, I tried writing them first. So I'm testing bugs def before deployment. So in this instance, the client wanted to make sure that a passenger train could not be oversold. So what does that require? To write the test, we need to know like, what the train is, what the capacity is, and how many tickets have been sold to date. And it's just a basic assertion of something like, tickets sold cannot be greater than capacity. The test passes, you deploy the code. Then what happens? Nothing. No client calls, no bug reports, it works as intended. You can keep working on that feature. So manually testing code. So we have another instance where we have very specific calculations, but this time it's to build train tracks. And that requires things like bolt sizes and torque specifications. And it's all kind of dependent on what type of train is going to use this track and where it's located. So is it going to be on a bridge? Is it going to be sandy? Is it going to be gravel? So instead of trying to sit there and manually test this code, I want to try and write a test for it. I want to be able to prove that this test works. So I create a test file. I repl replicate the calculations in that test. And then I write the code to make that test pass. And when it does, I can manually test it a couple times just to be sure, have the client look at the test, have the client look at the code, and then I can deploy it. And then I will know that if anything in the future ever causes that calculation to behave differently, we will have that notification that we need. So that's pretty nice. So I want to tell you about another legacy code experience that we had. And this time, I was pairing with a coworker. They had just been rolled on to another legacy project. Again, it was a brand new industry we knew nothing about. So again, little documentation on this. But there was a test tweet. So we could sort of figure out where we need to start it because the test could provide this roadmap for us and help us figure out what code did what. And at least give us an idea of what we needed to start writing our tests and writing this feature. So another benefit to having this test suite is not only did we, were we able to deliver this feature, but he was also able to get up to speed on this project a lot faster. So what did we learn from these coding experiences? So one is that client calling with bugs is never fun. They're having to drop everything you're doing to go back and fix a problem again. It just kind of ruins your day. And manually testing code is very tedious and time consuming. And legacy code is just a whole nother world of unknowns. And not having any sort of documentation or any descriptive tests to look at just make everything harder. So how did the latter experiences different from the first ones? And it was just simply that we wrote tests first. So what is test-driven development? And it's just a process of writing a test first and writing just enough code to make that test pass. So this is kind of what the process looks like. So you're going to write a test, run the test, and watch it fail. And then you're going to write just enough code to make that test pass. And then run it again. And if it passes, refactor. You probably want to run it again just to make sure any refactors didn't break. But that's it. So I want to take time right now to just say like, test-driven development is not a prescription for success. It's not tests for the sake of writing tests. But for me, it's getting that feedback that I want that makes me a more confident developer, that what I'm doing is correct and it's working as intended. So let's talk a little bit about Ember. So usually when I think about testing, you know, I want to know what I'm testing. 
or how I'm going to test it, or even why I'm going to test it. So let's start with some of the basics. There are three types of tests, unit acceptance and integration. So unit is just testing the smallest piece of functionality, you know, units of functionality. And acceptance tests, it's kind of like testing the user flow. So things like clicking a button or user logging in. An integration test is kind of somewhere in the middle where you're testing data and the actions. So things like making sure a computed property is displayed on a page or like making sure required fields are uh, completed before submitting. So in Ember, we can achieve this by using QUnit, which is what we're going to use for the sake of this talk. Uh, it comes packaged with Ember, but Ember is also compatible with other frameworks like Jasmine and Mocha. Running tests in Ember is really simple. You just run Ember test in your command line, and it'll run all of your tests. And if you run Ember test dash dash server, that works like a live reload. So anytime you make a file or make a change to a file and save it, then it'll automatically rerun your tests. Or if you have your server running, you can just go to localhost 4200 slash tests. And it comes with some really nice testing helpers. And these are only a few. And we'll see some of these when we go forward. But actions like visiting your URL or clicking something or finding a certain selector on a page. So let's talk about acceptance testing. So to create an acceptance test in Ember, it's really simple. In the command line, you can just type Ember G acceptance test and then whatever you want to name it. So we're going to use train station as our example. And this is the file that you get. So about half of it on the top is just set up and tear down. And this is the example that Ember gives to you. And since it's a user, uh, it's an acceptance test, so it's kind of user flow. So it's what a user would expect. So if they are visiting the train station, you would expect that they would actually visit that train station in the browser. And we would assume that the current URL is going to be train station. So it's kind of nice that Ember gives you like these, what I call like free examples to go off of. So let's look at another example of an acceptance test. So here we have train stations should be listed on the page. So if we think about that for a minute, as a user, what does that test take to pass? So the user needs to be able to visit a train station, and then they should be able to see trains listed on the page. And for the sake of this test, we're just going to say four train stations are going to be on the page. So what does it take to make this test pass? That's it. So all you have to do is make sure that you have the route in your application router and that you have your train station template. And for the sake of this, we have static data because we're not talking about pulling anything from an API or mocking data. You know, but that's a really basic example of how to get started in test-driven development. So let's look at a unit test. So Unit testing can be models or controllers, and you can test properties or computer properties or, or anything else that you could possibly put in a model or a controller. So let's start with an example of trains. Let's make a model of a train. And in Ember, you can really easily do that on the command line, similar to the acceptance test. You just type Ember G model train. And in addition to the train, or yeah, the train model, it will also automatically create your unit model test. And then you can start thinking about things like, what is a train made of? What really makes a train? It's kind of like that guaranteed delivery. What you think a guaranteed delivery might be could be really different. So let's look at that test file. So the top part, again, is what Ember creates for you. And it also gives you that other, what uh, it exists is kind of the example that it gives you for a model. And then down here, we've added a test it should correctly concatenate train name. So what does that mean, and what does it need to take to pass? So let's say, for this example, that a train name is what is used to help identify a train on a schedule, just for the sake of arguments. And that needs to look like the manufacturer and the manufacturer's model combined. 
So we know we have two attributes on a model called manufacturer and manufacturer model. And then we know that this train name function needs to return those two. And then this is how we make it pass. So again, this is another example of how you can start working up momentum into more complicated test-driven development. So we'll touch briefly on integration testing. Um, this is really good for components. Um, actions and data are behaving as they should together is really what you're testing with it, uh, integration tests. So things like alert banners or error messages or making sure that computer property is displayed on a certain page. Um, so I don't have any train related ones, but I did take this one from the Ember docs just to give you guys an example. So here it's a component for a title test. And we have two expectations. So we're going to render the component, and then we're going to assert that the text of the H2 field is hello world. And then when a user clicks on a button, it's going to change that text to this is magic. So if we wrote this test first, what would we need to write to make it pass? And it's just a small component that has a title, and it has an action to update that title. And then we need our template component. And that template component has the button with the action update title. So after all that's said and done, what are some of the additional benefits of test-driven development that we've seen? So not only did we get that feedback that I really needed, that I really wanted and desired, I wanted to know when something broke, but it promotes simplicity and flexibility. It helps with requirements and architecture design. And it helps you focus on what you're building and how to build it instead of just jumping in and writing a bunch of code, which we have a tendency to do. And it improves reliability. So those calculation methods can be deployed, and we don't have that worry in the back of our minds that maybe something down the road would change it. Because if it is changed, or if it is impacted in some way, we have a way to be notified, and that's a test failure. So I encourage you all to get out there and start testing. At least give it a try if you're not already. Um, Ember Docs and the Ember CLI user guide have really great resources um, for testing. And one of my favorite books is Growing Object-Oriented Software Guided by Tests. I highly recommend it if you're interested in testing. And just don't give up. If it seems hard at first, just keep trying, because you can do it. It's hard, and it's difficult, and if you heard anything about Brian's man talk, it can try your patience, but yeah. just give it a try, and that's it. And there's happy hour coming soon, so get out of here and go drink.